And I would say that even though Ido, I don't know that Ido is a special artisanal Japanese chef, we will talk about sushi today. Uh, and that is the Sunni Shiite tension, uh, abbreviated as sushi by some. Uh, not many, not many. Don't go around <laughs> using it for that. Uh, and so that's the, the introduction for today's uh, discussion. This is maybe the number one uh, contributing factor to understanding tension within the Muslim world uh, for the past 1400 years, roughly. So uh, we'll celebrate 1400 years uh, of that in three years or something. So yeah, right? Yeah. Oh, a little eight. bit later, right. Yeah, or 632, depends where you're... <laughs> right, depends where you draw the line. It. So, so Ido, thank you for coming back. It was excellent having you last time. And today we're having you and having sushi for dinner. So it's, uh, so it's even better. Okay, you know, you know the joke. Do you know, are you familiar with the term Jap? Jewish American princes? Yeah. So the joke goes uh, about this guy who, you know, who asked my, his wife, who was a Jewish American princess, oh, honey, what are we having for dinner? And she said, reservations. So without any more reservations, I, wel I welcome you to, to this uh, second session about the Muslim world. And let's, come on, take the reins. I'll just harass you every once in a while. I, I love your harassment and thank you for having me back. It's been... Uh... Wonderful being here the last time, um, and I'm happy to be back, and I'm happy to talk about a subject which uh, is very uh, influential in our days uh, and has a lot of impact on the Middle East in general. Um, but I would say that, that um, I always start my lectures with saying that I'm not a Muslim, and I'm not a, but if I were a Muslim, I would be Sunni and not Shiite. This, this is what, what I got to understand from my research on Islam. Um, if we look at the Middle East, um, we're, it, it's interesting to, to look at the Middle East, which is of course a, a Western term, but even if we look at the Islamic world or the Islamic empire or what's left of it, um, we live in a, in a minority complex in general. Even if you look at the Arab-Israeli conflict for a second, one of the biggest tra tra tragedies, tragedies of, um, of the conflict is that both populations see themselves as minorities. Right, uh, we actually had an amazing talk. You wouldn't believe, but like yesterday and the day before yesterday, we have two, we had two different guests, but that point was actually touched as on Monday we've talked about with Itamar Kremer who leads, I don't know if you know him, but he is uh, the head of the education school for Bet HaTefutzot and they have a new they have a new uh, exhibition in which uh, they have a very different kind of a little bit uh, uh, reconstructionist uh, approach to Judaism, if I may. Uh, and, and you don't mean it as a compliment? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm like assessing it as a scholar. You know, uh, that's that's, uh, and I don't think he would have posed that so much. Um, Itamar is a good friend. It's I'm not, uh, you know, and he said that one of the points that he is trying, he is enjoying as much as he can in this effort is when he sees like Bedouin kids and Arab kids come to Bet HaTfutzot and see that actually the Jewish people is or was or still is a minority around the world. And they get that experience and, and they get to maybe for a second see the place of being a minority that was like two days ago, we've talked with him, so that, that point actually was mentioned. And yesterday, uh, we've talked with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Reserves uh, Eyal Dro, who led the Good Neighbor Project in Syria for the IDF. And again, that notion of uh, minorities and, uh, and the Arab world and the Middle East actually came up as well, obviously. So, so it's exactly this. I mean, we see ourselves as a minority in the Muslim Arab neighborhood, um, when we are we are minority in that neighborhood, but if we look at, at the, the land of Israel or the, the state of Israel, we're a majority, and the Palestinians who are a minority here are actually part of a bigger majority 
in the Middle East, but when we talk about the Middle East, there is one significant minority, and that is the Shiites. If we look at, at different states in uh, different countries in the Middle East, we see that um, in Lebanon, uh, Shiites are considered, considered still a minority. Um, Which is funny. Lebanon has... The last, right, Lebanon yeah. has uh, a very, very unusual system. Exactly. And, and, and you can... They don't, they don't take a census, and there is a good reason they don't do it, right? The last census that was done in Lebanon was in 1934. And 1934. And from that day on, they don't take a census, but the whole political system is based on that census. Right, maybe, the maybe a, was... a word or two about how it is yeah. structured, because, because it's crazy. Uh, so, when, I, when I tell it to people, I, I, they, they are like, dumbstruck so let's okay hear it. so so in lebanon basically we speak of four different um sects we speak of christians who are basically moronites we are speaking of uh sunni muslims shiite muslims and druze uh, Ido, we are losing you Ido, is it just me, or no? no it's just us too. No, so I'll, I'll I'll let him know that we have missed him. The last word I heard was Druze, like four. Yeah, that's right. My, that's a, right. But he's there. He's back. I think he's oh, back. Nathan. Ido, we okay. lost you. We lost you. The last word we could hear was Druze. You said Druze. Most, okay. So uh, Christian, Christian Maroonites, Sunni Muslims, Shiite Muslims, and Druze, right. Yeah, and in the census of 1934, the majority was Christians. So the president, the highest office uh, in uh, Lebanon has to be, constitutionally has to be a Christian Maronite. The second in office, the prime minister has to be a Sunni, and the third one, the chairman of the parliament, the speaker of the parliament, is by necessity, again, a Shiite. Um, and the parliament itself, by the way, has five members, for each five members that are Maronites, you have five members that are Muslims, and that includes Sunnis, Shiites, and Druze. And, right, and, and, and the Druze, they get the chief of staff of the military, the Druze, right? they get the chief of staff of the army, which was up until a few years ago, uh, separated into different divisions that were also divisions according to religious and ethnic uh, um, belonging. So, uh, but they mixed it up a bit. And this led, of course, to two uh, civil wars. The biggest one was in 1975 in, in Lebanon, but that was back in 1934. Today, any number you'll throw from 50 to 70 percent are Shiites, but the Shiites in Lebanon are still centered in the south of Beirut, in the south of Lebanon, and in the Buka, the valley between the Lebanese mountain and the Syrian mountains, and these are the poorest in the land. But it's not only Lebanon, even if you look at Iraq, for example. In Iraq, the south of Iraq is completely Shiite, it's 60% of the population, but under Saddam Hussein, who was Sunni, they were persecuted. Uh, there are assessments of every third Shiite grown up who was killed in the 30 years that uh, uh, Saddam Hussein was president. Um, and to this day, now they're rebuilding Shiite power in, uh, in Iraq, but they still live this memory of minority. In Bahrain also, 65% of the population is Shiite, but the king is Sunni, the government is all Sunni, the parliament is all Sunni. Um, and also in other, in other places, in Yemen, you have 45 to 55% who, uh, who are Shiites from a different Now, now you, we should ask which Yemen, because Yemen is, is no, no longer one. And it's predominantly in the north, and that is, that is part of the problem we're talking about. That is part of what we're talking about. Also, when you look at Syria, in Syria, the, uh, the regime is Alawite, which is a section that was never really part of the Shiites, but they created this alliance in the 70s with the Shiites and are uh, very much uh, I very much identify with the Shiites. 
but there's still a minority in the rest of the land. 80% are Sunnis. So whether they are a minority by number or whether they are a minority by, um, by the way they are treated, Shiites are a minority every, almost everywhere except basically two countries, Azerbaijan, who's a predominantly Shiite country but very secular, and of course the Shiite country uh, with the capital V, uh, <laughs> um, which is the, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran. But just a second, that, uh, maybe, maybe it's uh, also worth mentioning that not just in individual countries they are a minority, they are a minority within the Muslim world and have been a minority. And this me minority mentality is reflected in their being. Th this is where we're going. So th we're talking about 20% of the Muslim world that are Shiites, 80% uh, are Sunnis. The Shiites themselves, by the way, are have like dozens of different sects, but the biggest sect is called 12 or Shiites. We'll talk about it in a second. Uh, there are 30% now of the Middle East. If you look at the Middle East, it depends on how you cut it. But in general, the Shiites live in this minority con complex, and it didn't start now. It started, as you said, 1,400 years ago. It started with, in, in the year 632. Maybe even the, the name Shiites this is where we go. Right, yeah. Yeah, so in Sorry for ruining, it's like telling me a joke is the worst thing, you know, because I always keep on, oh, just a second. So what's the end of the joke? So you're it's okay, talking, right? it's okay. <laughs> you're, you're, I told you, your harassments are great. I love them. Um, so in 632, the Prophet Muhammad dies. Um, and, and there's a tomb you, in Saudi Arabia. Everybody visits it. Um, it didn't, uh, I mean, it's one of, uh, Islam is very much a religion of, of monotheism, so no one, no one gets to live uh, more than, uh, than their life, um, and, and the Prophet dies, and there's a big argument. This is where, they, where it starts, if the Prophet left an inheritance to someone, whether he specified someone, named someone as his uh, heir, or you left it to the ummah, to the general population, to the nation, the Islamic nation, to decide who's going to be the heir uh, to his position. Now, his position at the time of his death was not only the prophet and the uh, founder of Islam, but it was also a political position. Islam, we talked about it last week, started with a sovereignty. And that heir was supposed to do both parts, both be the religious leader and the political leader. And the majority of the people back then said that he didn't leave, uh, he didn't name anyone as his heir, and that the ummah should uh, decide and vote on who's gonna be the caliph, who's gonna be the one who replaces the prophet, not as a prophet, but as a political and religious leader. Right, caliph is literally Replacer, like the pr person who is, comes. In. Yeah, it's it's inheritor. Uh, it's come from Khalaf, from right. Khalifa, same, right? To the to same exchange, uh, Hebrew, to come Hebrew, to replace. And it also gave the name, by the way, to California, uh, which was uh, named the Spaniard named it after a, a very famous novel back then that talked about this land where the daughter of the caliph. Uh, rules and that's where California comes from. Um, yeah, the, the most <laughs> again, you can see the red and the uh, green teaming together. <laughs> and and the the majority did convene in this uh, let's say kind of sukkah or or place where they voted for a caliph and they voted for uh, Abu Bakr. Abu became Bakr. Caliph. The, the name Abu Bakr became very famous recently with. Uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, obviously, leading but, the... Which is right. also very interesting, because Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was not born Abu Bakr, he was born Ibrahim. Yeah, sure, sure. And when he got, when he became leader of ISIS, he, a few months into his leadership, decided to adopt the name Abu Bakr, and people like me were going, no, he's not going to say that he's there. Oh, yes, he did it. He <laughs> pronounced himself Caliph. Um, because that was a very prominent sign that this is what he's going to do. Um, right, Abu Bakr, 
guys, you have to understand, we're still talking about like a family, okay? Somewhat of a family friends dispute. His daughter was married to Muhammad, okay? Aisha. Aisha. She was his right. youngest wife. The youngest um, wife, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm just was... learning because, you know, in case I, you know, in case in the future something, yeah. <laughs> and and he was also his uncle. He was also the Prophet's uncle. Very prominent Muslim, but, and it's a big but, there's a small fraction, a si'a. Si'a. Fraction, sh right. Uh, fraction. Uh, in Arabic, Shia. Age in Arabic, that's Shia. And this is Shiites. And so there's a small fraction that's saying, no, the Prophet did name an heir. He did name who should be Caliph. And he didn't name Abu Bakr. He, he named um, Ali. Ali bin Abi Talib was a cousin of the Prophet. But he and was also was married, married to his daughter. <laughs> but was also married to his fourth daughter, Fatma, who outlived, she's the only daughter that outlived uh, the Prophet. Right, um, guys, is is really the, the Khamsa the hand of Fatma or what, you know? <laughs> exactly. And Fatma also is be the bearer of children, okay? She has two children, Hassan and Hussein, okay? And uh, for linguistics... They were not reason, very creative with the name. You know, no, they didn't Hassan go too is, far. Hassan is good. Right. And Hussein, Fu'ail in Arabic, is uh, diminutive. So. Kelb is dog, Kuleib is puppy, uh, child is uh, walad, Wulaid is a little child. So Hassan, the good, and Hussein, the little good. Um, so uh, Hassan and Hussein are not only the daughters, the, the sons of Ali, they're also the grandchildren of the Prophet. Sounds almost uh, mythical, like uh, Rem Remus and Romulus, you know? Yes, Like exactly. Max and Moritz, like, yeah. <laughs> um, and but this fraction did not get any attention. Ali was forced to recognize the caliphate of Abu Bakr. Fatma was forced to, forced to recognize the caliphate of Abu Bakr, and Ali waited for his chance. And he did become the fourth caliph, but uh, he was disputed as caliph. It was the first time uh, in the short history of Islam where we had a civil war between Muslims, between people who supported Ali and people who supported the third caliph uh, before him, Uthman, and his cousin Muawiyah, and Muawiyah won. Uh, Ali was murdered. Uh, we'll, we won't get into that because it's a real drama there, but this is not, this is only part one. This is only the first chapter of this kind of, of Shiite feeling that history has been um, derailed and the, the people who derail it all the time are Sunnis. So instead of Ali becoming the first caliph, he became the fourth caliph and was murdered. But Ali also had sons, Hassan and Hussein, the grandchildren of the Prophet. And Hassan uh, was given bribes and uh, did not uh, want to become caliph. But Hussein, the younger brother, waited for his chance. And when the fifth caliph died, he tried to, um, to start a rebellion, but he was, uh, it, the rebellion was crushed. He was murdered. There's actually a very famous scene where he goes to this uh, plane in, uh, Karbala, in Iraq, right. Karbala, with a hundred of supporters, and they see the Muslim armies of the, of the caliph coming for them, and they see them from horizon to horizon. That's the... And they do the, the smart thing. Everybody runs away. Except, and this might sound familiar, Hussein is left with 72 supporters. And that number 72 will go through history. And today, when we talk about the Shaheed and the people who, who, who do suicide bombings and what they get at the end in heaven is 72 virgins. Um, and so, the, and this is a Shiite effect. We, we might want to, you might want to ask me about it later. Yeah, uh, just a second. <laughs> 72 goes back, goes back, uh, first of all, to the Septuagint, uh, which, but that goes back to the Book of Numbers, where you have 72 people chosen from the people to be the assembly that supports Moses when two of them stay in the camp. So, so much of that is deeply rooted in Christian and in Jewish sources. Even the number 72 is, 
uh, goes back to that. But I, I cannot emphasize enough how important is this day for Shiites? Because this is the day where we can really start about talking about Shiites. Uh, because the people who ran away uh, really regretted what they did. And they said, from this day on, we're not Sunnis. We're not going with the mainstream of Islam. We're Shiites. And we go with, the, well, not with the caliphs, but with imams. Imams, the, the question here is, who should lead the Islam? Whether it's friends of the Prophet, who might be family or might not be family, but are friends of the Prophet, and later on, what the nation decides or what history dictates, or the people who are saying, no, it's the family line. It's a direct line of Muhammad. So from Muhammad to Ali, to Hassan, Hussein, and to the children of Hussein, one child did not go, was not in Karbala. And from there on, it goes from father to son, from father to son, and these are the Imams. Now, this is the most Ashura, which is the day where Hussein, when Hussein was murdered, again, the, prophet, the prophet's grandsire, grandson is murdered by Muslims, okay? Um, so this tra tragedy is a tragedy that lives in Shiites to this day. To this day, they, are, uh, um, they go into mosques, they hear uh, songs about Hussein, they hit themselves to repent for what went through Hussein's, went, went uh, in Karbala, uh, yeah, again, to, in, in regards to the Ashura, it is the, the, their Day of Atonement, essentially. It's the it's tenth the, of Muhammad, oh, oh, Muhammad right? It's the, it was the first Day of Atonement, by the way, it was the first also uh, fasting in Islam was, uh, was Ashura. The, prophets, uh, the Prophet already fasted, fasted uh, on that day, but then he moved it to Ramadan. Um, but for the Shiites, this day, this is the most important day. And they don't, now when Shiites hit themselves or cry, and they really do cry in these, on these days, are, it's, it's, it's really some, sometimes horrible sights where they hit themselves and there's blood everywhere and there's crying everywhere. They don't only cry for, the, for Hussein, they cry also for 1,400 years of persecution uh, of Shiites by Sunnis. Because from that day on, Shiites were treated by Sunnis uh, as a minority that should, that should not be tolerated, let's put it this way. They were persecuted at points, they, they were not allowed even to profess their faith. Um, and there's a, a linkage, also a historical link, linkage worth doing, not only through the question of who would inherit Muhammad, whether it's the family or the friends, but also at a certain point, there's a connection between Iranians and Shiites. And that connection goes with the Arab conquest of the uh, Iranian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Sassanid Empire. The Persians to this day do not believe that the Arabs conquered them. They, they, they can't fathom how come these Arabs, who in the eyes of many Persians are inferior, uh, how come they managed to conquer them so fast, so fast and so uh, in such a, uh, an ultimate way? And so a lot of the Persian beliefs went into the Shiites. For example, the, the, the ancient Persian religion was a dualistic religion. They had a good God and a bad God. This is very present, or, or the differentiation between what's in your body and outside, uh, light versus darkness, this world versus the next world. These are very present in Shiite uh, theology. And this is a very strong influence of Persian. Uh, of Persian theology, of Persian religion in general. And this is very present. And to this day, um, it, the Arabs constitute only 20% of the Muslim world. But Muslim uh, um, religious people, uh, sheikhs, muftis, the rabbis, uh, the qadis, they, if, if, if you're at a certain level, you have to learn Arabic. You have to know Arabic. Yeah, so but it, it also, maybe it also has to do with the special status of, of the Quran in Islam, because you, you mentioned that before, and that's an important distinction between like Christianity and Islam, that Muhammad is a prophet, but he's completely a person, a man, while the text itself, the Quran, so to speak, is the Jesus of Islam in some aspects. It's, it's a very interesting comparison. 
and the Quran does carry a lot of, of, of let's say, holiness to the point where it is believed to not be created, but to always exist side by side, if you can say that with Allah. Uh, it's the, the literal world, word of God. Um, but a lot of people, most of the Muslim world, read it without understanding it. But if you're a, if you're a religious leader, you have to know Arabic at a certain point. For Shiites, if you're a religious leader, you have to know Persian at a certain point. Uh, and, and a lot of people who we know as leaders, Shiite leaders that are totally Arab, like Hassan Asrallah, for example, they speak to perfect to Persian. Persian. Right. They speak wonderful Persian because they have to know it, because all the religion is written in Persian. Um, but, and this per persecution um, was... Again, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but because there were centuries where we had Persian influence and there were centuries in Islamic empire, you, you, you had dynasties that were Shiites. The Fatimis, for example, were Shiites and they conquered most of North Africa, also part of Israel. They also established Cairo um, and they established in Cairo a university named after Fatma. Fatma in, in Shiite theology is called Fatma Zahra, the bright one. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. They formed the university called Al Azhar. And then when Salah al Din, who's a Sunnite, conquers uh, Cairo, he, he turns Al, Al Azhar into a Sunni university. And to this day, it's the biggest Sunni university, uh, religious university in the Muslim world, and the most influential one. Um, but in general, Shiites were always treated as something esoteric, as something uh, that should be at best tolerated, usually not tolerated. Uh, they were always suspected because of this uh, equation between Persians or Iranians and Shiites. They were always suspected in the, in the Arab world as being too Persian or under Iranian influence and not really being Arabic enough. Um, and when you look, for example, at the basic things of religion, the basic commandments of life, of, of life, there isn't a very big difference between Shiites and Sunnis. They pray pretty much the same. Shiites pray a bit differently, but the prayers are basically the same. They all do the Hajj. They all go to Mecca. Uh, in the Medina that is an interesting <laughs> point about the Hajj because, uh, I, again, Shuni, Sunni, Shi, Shiite difference. As far as, and again, with the Jewish point here, because I cannot help it, uh, Judaism, as, as you know, it has a very interesting solar lunar calendar. The Muslim calendar is a lunar calendar, essentially. And to decide where the, where the, when the month starts, you have to accept witnesses uh, originally in Judaism as well. Today we have a, a different system. We've talked about it in the past here. Uh, but in the Muslim world, you still have like uh, courts that have to accept the witnesses. Obviously the Sunni ones would not accept Shiite witnesses and the Shiite one would not accept Sunni witnesses. So usually it's not a big problem. Let's say the month starts a day later, a day earlier, it can happen except for one month, Du al Hajj, right? The, the month the of the, the right. Dual Hajj, yeah. Right. Because when you, when you, and then they have to coordinate to the same point. Now, I would say even more than that, usually Sunni courts are not in, in agreement. Okay, for example, the last Ramadan, Turkey stopped it the day before everyone else. Why? Because that's how they saw the, the moon and they got the testimony and that was it. Um, and and it's, it's very problematic. Usually, Sometimes uh, in, the same, in the same country, you have two different courts. Um, so even the Sunnis are usually not in agreement about, about things like that. Um, but again, going to the day-to-day, -day, it's very similar, very much affected by where you live. But for example, I'll, I'll tell you a, a nice story about how Shiites and, and Sunnis treat themselves. There is a Shiite neighborhood in Cairo. It's not very famous, but they're, they're very, small minority, 1%, maybe even less, of Cairo is, is a Shiite neighborhood. And I have a friend who's... Uh, you don't, we lost you. 
Lost him at the friend. <laughs> right, right. He froze at the friend. They, yeah. yeah. Scary friend. Scary story, right. Maybe he lost the data. <laughs> Ido, Ido, you froze with the word friend. I froze said, with a friend. So I have, I have this friend who's very religious in Cairo. And he went, and it was time to pray, and it was in a Shiite neighborhood. So he went inside the mosque and prayed there. And when he came back home, and his father asked him what he did, and he said he went to pray in a, in a, Shiite, uh, in a Shiite mosque, his father almost threw him out of the house. Because... You will not, if you're a Sunni, you will not pray in a Shiite mosque. Um, but usually, this doesn't happen because usually Shiites and, and Sunnis don't live together. Now, so for years, for 1,400 years, we have this balance of power where the Shiites knew that they're a minority and the uh, uh, Sunnis knew that they are, the, they are the hegemony and they are the dominant ones. Now, this also gave the Shiites a very, especially the Twelver Shiites in this case, uh, a somewhat messianic uh, notion to their religion. Because the Twelfth Imam, according to the Twelver Shiite, the Twelfth Imam, when he was four, his father was executed by the Caliph, and he escaped into a cave. And for 70 years, uh, from the end of the 9th century to the middle of the 10th century, uh, he communicated to the outside world, to the small Shiite community, through four apostles, you can say. And these apostles were also killed in 940. And the Shiites believe that this imam simply went out of the cave and disappeared. And disappeared, and to this day, he walks amongst, amongst us in a regular, looking like a regular human being, but he's actually the 12th imam. And when the day comes, at the end of days, he will uh, show himself and reveal himself to the world, and he will be al-Mahdi, he will be the Messiah. And then everyone will know that the Shiites were right, and there's a whole eschatology there that uh, in Shiite tradition, it's very developed. And there are Shiites who to this day very much believe in the presence of this Imam, of this uh, disappearing Imam. And this Imam al-Muntaza, the one who you wait for, I'll, I'll give you an example for how present he is in, in, in Shiite's life. In Iran, they established a majlis, a parliament, for the first time in 1906. Uh, Mahdi. The word for Messiah is Mahdi. Um, so in Iran, they established the majlis, uh, the parliament in 1906, and they signed the constitution. And that constitution is signed, so it says, in the presence of the Imam, in the presence of the Mahdi. In Iran, there's also a place called Jamkaran. There's a well there. And you go and you put notes in the well, and it goes to the Mahdi. And now, now, we are not impressed by it, because you see Netanel is sitting, and we have we cut the middleman. <laughs> we have it straight in the Kotel, and it goes straight to God. But in Shiite, it's, in, in Shiite again, theology is very popular to talk with God, uh, the disappearing hiding process. It's called in, in Arabic, al-imam al-mustatir. Al-mustatir, uh, the one who hides, or al-muntadar, the one who we wait for. Um, and, but just for an example, uh, you know Ahmadinejad, have you heard about Ahmadinejad? He was president of Iran in the, a few years back. His first government uh, meeting was held in Jamkaran because he believes very strongly that the Mahdi is close. And uh, Jam... I'll uh, write it. I'll write it. Yeah. No, don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll take the... I'll, I'll give you another example which goes and we'll take it a, a step forward. Uh, well, we'll take it a step forward, and then I'll give you another example of how the imam is present. Um, in 1970, what happens is that for 1,400 years, we had this stability in the Middle East. The dominant Sunnis, the Shiites were a minority, 
Iran was a state, was a strong state, but uh, in, in, from the 16th century onwards, it's a strong kingdom inside the Muslim world. Uh, but everybody knows it's Iran, and it's for, as long as it stays there, it's okay. But in the last 50 years, 70 years or so, what we see is an awakening of the Shiites. It's a political, religious awakening of the Shiites. And it starts uh, with Shiites in Lebanon, who started to establish political parties um, with, um, uh, with a, a religious uh, um, ayatollah called uh, 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 Musa Sadr. And that uh, Imam Sadr, uh, he was Iranian, but originally from Lebanon, and he came to Lebanon. And he started this political awareness for Shiites in Lebanon. He's the one who started Amal, who's now the second uh, largest party in Lebanon. He started a movement called the Movement of the, Depre of the Oppressed, which is a very Shiite name, the Movement of the Oppressed. And in 1978, he went to Libya and disappeared. And so another Imam disappeared. Uh, and by the way, to this day, he's still head of the Shiite highest council in Lebanon. The head of it is Musa Sadr, and the, the person who runs it is the deputy. But it started with him, but soon enough it got to Iran. In 1979, we have the Islamic Revolution in Iran, uh, and uh, Imam, uh, I call him Imam because that's how everybody called him, but his name is Ruhala Musavi Khomeini, who is Ayatollah, who is high priest, uh, high Shiite priest, and he comes back to Iran after 15 years in exile, and everybody is starting to call him Imam Khomeini, Imam Khomeini, as if saying he's the Imam. He's, here, here comes redemption, here comes the Messiah. Now, he did not correct anyone calling him Imam. He let them believe he was the Imam. And that was part of how he controlled or got into power in Iran, which is a very Shiite country. And, um, but he died in 1989. So now everybody knows he's, he was not the Imam, but it's very, it's, it's a common opinion in Iran that he met face to face with the hidden Imam. Um, and, that, and, and I would like to suggest at this point, before we talk about the awareness, one more interesting thing about Shiites in general. And it's an interesting thing about religions in general. Um, a lot of the time we look at Islam, and if we'll be honest, we'll say they're stuck in the Middle Ages. Um, and I would like for us to think of this term, ijtihad. Ijtihad is the ability of a religious person, a, a qadi or a mufti or someone who's uh, a, a religious, um, I don't know how to call it, a, a priest maybe? Um, authority. Authority. Ijtihad is the ability of this religious authority to, um, to give a new law, okay? To adopt something new into the religion, okay? For example, whether it's a technological thing, electricity, or whether it's an idea like women's rights, okay? And in Sunni belief, ijtihad is a very hard thing to do because from the 10th century onwards, the spirit of God no longer rests on the religious authorities. And so there's a mujtahid, there's a person who does ijtihad maybe once in a generation. So basically when a religious authority today is asked the question, okay? For example, should we allow um, um, different medical technologies inside? Uh, is it allowed in religion? He will not try and, and see how it fits. He will go back and see why it doesn't fit and say no. Okay, so for example, when the first uh, printing machines got to the Ottoman Empire, to the uh, Turks, they said, the religious authorities said, no, we cannot do it. It's not allowed in the religion. And they uh, rejected it, and it took 100 years later for it to go inside and become allowed. So in many senses, the Sunni world is stuck. It's stagnated. 
back in the 10th century because everybody's trying to go back to a higher authority. In the Shiite world, this does not exist. Everybody can be a mujtahid. They actually call some of the religious authorities a mujtahid because the imam is ever present and his light, this is their belief, is here. And therefore they can be more open in a sense, flexible in a sense. Sometimes we see Iran as this dark country where dark things happen. It's very different than what we think. And, and, right. I'll, give you, and I'll give you a small example. Can I guess very... what the example is? <laughs> Yeah, don't guess it. Don't ruin it. Okay, so I'm not guessing. Don't guess it. <laughs> I'll write it on a note. And then I, no, I'm just kidding. I, I can see by your smile that you know where I'm going. <laughs> uh, so, for example, if you think of uh, transsexualism, you think of, uh, no, not marriage, although marriage is also a great example. I'll give you that, but I'm going even further than that. Thailand is the number one countries where they have operation for uh, sex change. Number one country in, in numbers. But the number two country is Iran. Iran uh, is doing about 400 to 500 operations, sex change operations in a year. And it's religiously, sang it's, it's allowed in religion. And it starts with this person now called Maryam Khatun Mulkaresh, he's no longer alive, but he was a man. And he wrote to Khomeini in the 80s, when he was the leader of Iran, and he said, help me, Imam Khomeini. I'm a woman stuck in a man's body. And now every religious leader we know, in a conservative religious area we know, would, would dismiss it. Not Khomeini. This is Ijtihad. He said, past times, we weren't able to help the inner inner self of people uh, go outside or, or express, uh, express it. Now we have the technology to do it and it is allowed. Now this sounds very, you know, almost uh, California liberal in a sense, but we should consider... Yes. Yeah, Simon is, Simon exactly. is putting... Yeah, yeah, Simon, yeah. this is where we're going. Because in Iran, if you're a homosexual, you're hung uh, uh, in front of your house. Uh, they just hang you. But if you're caught, and I, I really don't know what it means, but this is it. If you're caught in a homosexual situation, but not in the act itself, you have two choices. You can either be hanged or you can go through the sex change. Because if you're a man and you love men, then your inner self, you're a woman. Uh, so this is Iran. Um, Laws, they have a lot of laws. It's, it's like... No, uh, but if we want to put a number, so Muslims have basically five pillars. Then, but it's more, it's yeah, more than that. I mean, just sure. like in Judaism, where, where you have from the moment you start your day to, the, to, the, to everything you do up until the evening and special occasions and everything, this is the same both in Sunni Islam and uh, Shiite Islam. It's, it's uh, religious law is... is how you deal with life in general. It's, it's all comprehensive, it's, it's all including. But this is an example of Ijtihad. And in many cases, a lot of the things we see in the Arab world, treatment of women, uh, um, a lot of, of, the, of the rejection of modernism in general, we don't see it in Iran. And we don't see it sometimes with other Shiite populations because of that ability to be flexible because of the jihad, because the imam is still here. So I wouldn't say, for example, a lot of people are saying the Shiites, they're more uh, radical or more extreme. In many cases, they are not. Uh, but they are uh, very special in, in that sense. And I, and I would like to maybe end and then give uh, room for questions. Uh, with what we have today. Because what we have today is, uh, I usually like to say, it's the geek of the classroom that was being hit for 1,400 years, and now he's coming back for the bully. Uh, and this is what we see with Iranian involvement in the Middle East. Iranians see themselves as uh, a Middle East 
power, okay? And therefore they have to challenge the other powers, which is Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Israel, although Israel doesn't like to think of itself as part of the Middle East, we are part of the Middle East. Um, and it's been rumored that one of these powers have nuclear weapons, so the Iranians are gonna do their best. I didn't read about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you've heard about it. But, um, so they're gonna do their best to find nuclear weapons and, and to get to that point. Uh, they see themselves as the Shiite leaders Shiites are coming back. They're no longer just waiting for the imam to come. They want their rights. They want vengeance, okay? And where, whenever there are Shiites, there's Iran involved. So whether it's Lebanon with Hezbollah or Syria with the Alawites, again, uh, uh, an alliance that was formed in the 70s, and whether it's in Yemen. Yemen had one of the most peaceful sects of Shiites. It's called the, the Zaydis. And the Zaydis were like, yeah, bad things happened, but it's okay, a lot of time passed. It was for the good of the, of the general nation, but they were Shiites. And Iranian involvement just pushed them, and now we have a civil war that is probably the most horrible place to be in the world, it's Yemen right now, between Shiites and non-Shiites. And whether it's also being involved in the Middle East, in, in, in Palestine, in Palestine, Israel, we don't have Shiites, everybody's Sunnis, but Iran will try to get a foothold here because it's part of, they see themselves as the Muslim leaders of the world, also leaders of the Muslim world. So, uh, so this is something that affects every aspect of the Middle East where we see Saudi Arabia, who didn't want it to have anything to do with Israel, are now openly talking about relationship with Israel and diplomatic relations and planes flying with uh, above Saudi Arabia and stuff like that, because they understand that the, the, the Iran is very close to them geographically, but it's a real threat, and it's better to be to have a good power uh, alliance with Israel than uh, to go with the Iranians. I would say that just to end it, that this is one way to look at it. You can also look at it as a nationalistic way. Uh, Iran is a very nationalistic state. They're very proud, very patriots of their Iranianism. Uh, and, and you can see fractions within the Shiite world as well. As well. For example, the Shiites in Iraq are now, leaded by, uh, are now led by, um, by a government and by religious authorities that are in uh, some kind of or, uh, conflict with Iranian leadership. So it's, it's more complicated than that. Uh, but it definitely affects the Middle East as we know it. Okay, uh, excellent. Hopefully, yeah, you were saying some of this. That was, I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any questions, please? Right. First of all, it was wonderful. We learned so much, and and it's so enjoyable to kind of really have a, a new perspective, a little bit more nuanced understanding of what's going on in the Muslim world and, and not to bulk everything as the Muslims or the even the Sunnis, the Shi Shiites, but to rather get a more nuanced and more understanding version of what's going on. And let's hear the questions. I, I harassed you enough. So uh, Nancy, go ahead. You have to unmute Nancy. Nancy? Okay, so while Nancy's working on, on getting her microphone open, Russ, go ahead. Ido, please tell us about a Shiite temporary marriage. No. <laughs> right. So, yeah. I can see I can see that this is this is always very interesting in, in terms of, of lecturing that you can talk about politics as much as you want, but eventually it's marriage and changing sex. This is what, what people want to hear. But this is also very interesting because it, it has actually very interesting social implications. Um, there's a verse in the Quran where the Shiites interpret it as a permission to marry someone in a temporary marriage. 
Now, no one else, there are some really esoteric sects in Sunni, Shia, in Sunni Islam that might, on the edges of it, interpret it like this, but the Shiites in general, and especially the Shiites in Iran, uh, interpret it as a permission to marry in a temporary marriage between a night and 99 years. Okay, so you can marry someone for a night, and that's it. You don't have to divorce her. Uh, there's not uh, a lot of changing of... of uh, um, you don't have uh, to run to the DMV to change the <laughs> no, no, license or now, anything. In, in Iran today, it's good for three things, okay? The first thing, you have, you have an economic crisis. Because of sanctions, because of, of a deep economic situation, crisis where we're in right now because of corona, Iran was hit, coronavirus hit Iran very hard. Uh, but even before that, so marriage is a costly thing because property goes from the uh, husband to the wife, from the wife to the husband, from the families. In this marriage, nothing. It's a small amount, and that's it. So people marry 99 years ahead, and, and they're settled. Also, uh, in Iran, a lot of students want to have um, student social life. And so what they How do... How nicely you put it. That's nice. So what they do is marry in this interim marriage, in this temporary marriage for two weeks. And if it's good, they continue it for another two weeks and so on and, and continues. The third thing is that there are houses in Iran, official houses, where you can go and marry someone for a night. And everybody knows it exists. Once, in a, month, once a month comes a religious authority of a sort, goes through the papers, to make sure everything is according to religion. And you have basically legalized prostitution in Iran today, uh, which is crazy to think about. The Sunni world is looking at it and is going, huh? <laughs> Where did you go wrong? Um, and, and the rest of the world is looking at it a bit crazy. But again, this is part of what we call ijtihad. It's part of how they uh, adjust religion to life, in a sense. Not in a not in a good way, in my opinion. But this is so. This is about uh, temporary marriage, right? Uh, Nancy, did you? Uh, yeah. Yep, I ahead. figured it out. Thank you, Ido. This was, I've tried to figure out some of this stuff for a long time, and I think you were the most helpful. Of it's really helped been helpful. But my question is, how do you see Turkey fitting into this? Is that more just a political move with Erdogan and not really a religious? Could you speak to that? It's a great question because uh, Turkey is also, a, I talked about uh, the four powers uh, and, and I, I would say something first in general. First, we see in the past uh, 40 years or maybe even 20 years, the Arab weakness, okay? 20 years ago, if you wanted to get something done in the Middle East, you would go, or 25 years ago, you would go to Mubarak, the president of Egypt, you would go to a certain extent to Hafez al-Assad, the president of Syria, okay? And the Saudis took a back role, a back, uh, a back position in this. Or you'd go to Saddam Hussein, who's crazy, but you'd go to him if, if you need something done. Today, when matters in Syria need to be decided, so you have uh, a summit between Putin, Erdogan, and uh, Rouhani, and the president of Iran. So you have... so. None of which is Arab. None of which is Arab. The fourth power involved in Syria in, in many ways is Israel, which is not Arab. So this is the weakness of the Arabs. But I would say this about Erdogan. Erdogan is part of what we talked about last week, about uh, what was non or anti-institutionalized uh, Islam. Uh, and his part is very much ideologically uh, aligned with Muslim brethren in general. Um, but what happened in Turkey is that Turkey is a democracy. So the people who remain religious throughout the days uh, of this very secular state, or in sometimes military rule, when they got the chance to vote, they voted religiously. They voted for a political religious leader like Erdogan. But it doesn't end with that. Erdogan sees himself as restoring ancient Turkey hegemony, he tried to look west to Europe. The Europeans said, 
no chance they're going to be part of Europe. And now he's looking east. And when Erdogan is looking east, he doesn't look east only to the Middle East, although he's now he's very much involved. He looks east all the way to China. Okay, so you have Turkish schools in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzstan, and this is where he's going. And he sees himself as a power, very dominant power in the Middle East. Um, but, and it's a big but, Turkey had this, the misfortune of meeting the Russian bear uh, in Syria. They did the mistake of, of, of uh, uh, poking it down. a little bit oh, too hard. Yeah, they, they poked a bit too much. They took a, a, a plane, a Russian plane down, if you remember, like eight years ago, nine years ago, um, or even less. Uh, and the Russian said, uh-uh, <laughs> we're not going to have that. And that was it. He understood that he can't do too much uh, to annoy Putin. And so what happens now is that basically you have this, it's not an alliance even, it's this containment of these two powers under, Pu under Putin. So you have Putin containing both the Iranians and the Turkey and the Turks, um, but uh, and and now Erdogan is looking for other options. For example, very much involved in Libya now. Uh, Libya is now in a civil war between basically uh, government uh, funded and supported by Egypt and a government funded and supported by the Turks. Um, so it's again. It's, it's a play in the, in the Middle East chess, but there are no ideological or religious alliances between Iran and Turkey. It's ad hoc uh, alliances, let's put it this way. Okay. Um, Georgie. Uh, thank you for the enlightening uh, talk. I w wish to raise a question. It is uh, based on the uh, context of what you said about the Persian language, uh, because I can understand Arabic and the Hebrew are forming in the same uh, Semitic language. Does that uh, paradigm come into the Persian language? So, no, the Persian language is an Indo-European language, um, and the Persians see themselves as part of the Aryan uh, people to the point where in 1941, they started an alliance with, with the Nazis, um, and then the British squashed it. Um, but I, I love to play a game. I don't know much Persian, but if you think of mother, then in Persian it's medar, father, pedar, brother, baradar. Baradar, dokhtar. Dokhtar. And, 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 and also when you look at, at, at verbs like to be, it's ask, which is is. And East, so it's it's a very much a Indo-European language with a lot of Semitic influence in the lexicon because of Arab uh, and Islam, because of Arabic and Islam. We also have some Persian words that made it to the Hebrew, maybe chief among which is the Hebrew word for religion, which is yeah. that, that uh, which is similar to the English data. By the way, it's, it's the mm -hmm. same Indo-European datum in Latin. Right, given, given what is given. The the decree was given in the datum. Right. Very good. Uh Simon, I saw your hand was up before. Do you still have that question before we wrap things up? Well it's a it's a different question actually. Um <clears throat> but I was interested in what you said about how Islam came to Persia, but did not actually replace the local population, as presumably happened in, in other places. So how did it how did it embed itself without um, Arabic rulers? First of all, there were Arabic rulers, there weren't many Arabs, but to this day, by the way, there's a minority of Arabs in Iran, we talked about minorities. Iran is a state, is a country of minorities. The, the majority are Shiites, but the Persians, for example, in Iran are 60 to 70 percent. The rest are Kurds and Azars, and also Arabs in the south, in Khuzistan. Um, but um, what happened was they had Arab rulers there, but it was a brutal occupation. They destroyed 
almost all the temples they could find. Um, and the Persians still, the Iranians still live it as a, tra as a tra trauma, a serious trauma to the point yes. where this is the first Arab war. The second Arab war was in 1980. So, so almost 1,300 years between the, between the first Arab war and the second Arab war, which was the war, Iran-Iraq war. Um, so yes, it was a brutal occupation. And again, it was very interesting that their religion was adopted. They adopted Islam, but they adopted a very certain version of Islam, very influenced by uh, Persian uh, theology. Because if someone came and beat you up, you wouldn't say, oh, um, by the way, can I have your, your religion, please? You take our history and our temple, but we'll have your religion. Uh, so there must have been some process there. When, when we look at uh, how people became Muslim, uh, so it's not as we imagine it that Islam forced itself, but it was in the span of, let's say, 100 years. This is a, a, a research by Bulliet when he, talked, he looked at, at names, names of, of in burial sites. You see the, that in a span of 100 years, the names change into Muslim names. And what happened yeah. was probably through economic pressure in a sense because Muslims <clears throat> had if, if well Arabs didn't have to pay any taxes at first but Muslims had to pay uh, less taxes and so it was a, a, an economic pressure more than a, right. a, a, it's a, all about the cheese and the jizya right the jizya <laughs> it's all about the jizya yes right uh, so there's a that special tax that non-Muslims have to uh, pay in Muslim uh, country. I had a student, I, I want to finish with this story. I had a student originally uh, born in Syria. He learned, uh, uh, he learned medicine in Aleppo, in Khalab, and then uh, in Germany, in Dusseldorf. And he was, uh, he was a doctor in Saudi Arabia. And today is in Canada, by the way. But I asked him, Listen, we, he was a Sunni Muslim, uh, and, I, and I talked with him. We became very good friends. I, I still keep in touch with him. I said to him, listen, you know, uh, think about it. You know, Dimi are second-class citizens, you know. Is it the, how do you reconcile, you know, me being a second-class citizen in, in a state that would be Muslim? You know, me pay paying the jizya, I didn't get into paying the jizya in what way, you know, being all l like lower than and bowing down. So he said, listen, at the end of the day, you don't have to pay zakat, you know. <laughs> so, so, it, so that was the explanation that, you know, <laughs> they have to it pay charity. Out. Right, it balances out. So that's uh, a funny story I had with him. And thank you very much for coming, Ido. I, Thank you. We enjoyed it so much, so I, I hope that we'll get an opportunity in the future to talk about more subjects because you have uh, infinite interesting knowledge and it is so uh, fun to talk about these and it's so enriching for everybody. So we'll have to figure out the, the when and the what and the how, but you are very welcome to talk with us about anything you find that you wish to uh, tell us. We are so blessed to have you here. It's been thank my pleasure, much. really. It's been so much fun, and I hope I would come again. And thank you. Really, sure. thank you so much. Sure. This is, by the way, why I bother you all the time, so you won't finish what you have to talk about, and then you have to come again. That's, so, yeah, it's, so it's not a bug. It's a feature. Of the <laughs> Great strategy. Yeah. <laughs> Good strategy, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank thank you, you know. very Guys, much. I know that some so of you have written to me in the past 24 hours and I have not written back. I hope that I'll have the time to sit and write you back uh, today. And that's it, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'll see you tomorrow. Very, very good. Thanks. Thank you. you. See you. See you. I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to your email on your reading glass. Okay. Yeah, sure, I will. Yeah, I, me too. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Ta-da-ba. -bye. Huh?